Okay, welcome to thermodynamics. Um, I think last time we ended talking about this, all this stuff, this stuff to do with fuels. That's where the energy from fuels comes from. The other ones are your basic mechanics. They play a role, but we're going to ignore those mostly. We're going to focus on the, the work and energy uh, stored by it. This is basically heat energy, and this is the physical work energy. The pressure times the volume. Take this to, you know, 100 PSI, and you push it, you know, so much change in volume, that's a certain amount of work. And if that volume comes in area times the distance, and 100 PSI gives you over a certain amount of area, gives you a force, and the force times the distance, it's equivalent. Uh, and sort of the whole point of thermodynamics, we really wouldn't care unless if, if we could turn heat into work. And sometimes we need to do some work to keep the cycle going. You have to pump the water back up to pressure before it boils in the boiler. So we're, there's an equivalence there, and then there's efficiencies, and that's what this is all about. Um, the internal energy is that, that part of the C sub T, the temperature difference. And what it really is, is all of the kinetic energy on a molecular scale. If something's really cold, it's, it, you take the energy out of it, we feel it as cold. But what that really means is the molecules are less kinetic energy in a couple different ways. There's bonds. And, and like a hydrogen molecule is H2, but it can not only move, it's, it's the motion, that, what causes pressure is how fast uh, something bounces off the walls of something, how fast the molecule is going. And as you cool it down, it slows down, you're taking energy out of it, and that lack of kinetic energy on a molecular scale shows up as less pressure. It also shows up as on a solid, is temperature, or temperatures, they're all, it's all, it comes down to essentially this molecular scale kinetic energy. The kinetic energy can be stored as, and, and this would be something for physics or for uh, physical chemistry or those guys, they deal with this stuff, but um, a molecule, molecule can move, the bonds themselves can have a resonant frequency. That's frankly how your microwave works. The microwave sends radio waves out at a frequency that is the resonant frequency of water. And the heating element in your food is actually the water in the food. If you put something completely dry in there, it's probably not going to get warm. It's not going to do it very effectively. But if you put water in there or anything that contains water, the water itself is the heating element because you're taking it the energy is absorbed into this resonant structure, which is the hydrogen for the H2O, and this and not hydrogen, but H, you know, water molecule. It has two hydrogen bonds off to the side. They're vibrating like this. They can also swing in and out. It can flip around. It can flip that way and this way, and it can go and it can move. There's all those different ways it can absorb energy. Um, so what we sent you is temperature is that kinetic energy in a bunch of different ways, rotating, vibrating, all that. And the microwave is just one way to cause them, in, instead of giving it heat energy and having molecules on the surface of a pot shake the, the molecules and then they start shaking the next molecules, instead of doing it that way, we just literally, with the microwave, you just send waves in and an individual quanta of energy will hit a molecule, it'll just get absorbed and it starts shaking. And it, and it, that's the internal energy part of it. Um, there's another, this nuclear energy. Uh, it seems to me somebody was expressing an interest in the nuclear energy thing. Yeah, and you know, basically all nuclear energy is, is it does what coal does. It creates heat. And then you use the heat um, to make steam, and then from there on, it's just a steam-generating power plant. Uh, 
So, you know, what goes on is, is there's, it's that the glue that holds it together, um, and I don't understand, I mean, I, I took the modern physics way back when, in fact, you know, now it'd be antique, but it was modern physics, they called it in 1979, and uh, which is, is basically everything from Einstein forward, you know, relativity and all that. But that gets back to this E equals MC squared. Um, Einstein figured out that the amount of energy that's, uh, that this is a neat little formula. Uh, it's like one half MV squared, only it's MC squared. And the M there is missing mass. If you take uranium 230, whatever, and you have fission where it basically breaks apart, and you start off with 238 grams. When it breaks off, you end up with two parts that are less than 238 grams. I mean, there's some mass that's missing, a real tiny part. But that missing mass got converted into energy. So what does it do? It shakes everything up. It's like this energy. It's like the glue dissolved and turned into heat. Um, and how much heat does it turn into? The amount of energy involved is that missing mass glue, I'll call it. I'm not sure exactly, you know, it's not, it's not a missing particle, it's just gone. <coughs> Times the speed of light squared tells you how much energy you get. Um, weird thing about nuclear power is, uh, I'm not sure where I, which book I saw this in. It might be the text for 411 might have this thing, but um, you can run, say, a hundred gigawatt nuclear power plant for a year on essentially a pickup load, like a one ton of, of nuclear fuel. And when you're done, you still got a ton of nuclear fuel, but it's been spent. You could have a breeder reactor that then takes that and turns it in back into fuel. And if, if your power plant was using a breeder reactor, it's actually making more fuel. And at the end of the year, you would have two pickup trucks worth of fuel. But you'd also have plutonium that you had to refine out of, I mean, you have to re-refine it. It, it changes phase. And the, the real problem with nuclear power is, is among other things, is the radioactive stuff is unnaturally, con it's a naturally occurring thing. It's in the core of the Earth, but it occurs in an unnatural concentration when you make it, build it up enough for a power plant. And then all the things that the radiation uh, creates, uh, how do you deal with that for environmental reasons? And more than that, uh, if you do have a breeder reactor and you make more and you end up with this byproduct that's plutonium, that's weapons grade stuff. And really it comes down to are people smart enough to deal with all of that? And that's, <laughs> that's the real issue. From an energy and an engineering point of view, it's it's truly magic. Uh, environmentally and politically, it's a major hot potato. But all it really does is create some heat, and then we use the heat to make uh, things that we make heat with. So usually, what'll happen? I don't know if I have the uh, slide. Um, it may be coming up, but. Uh, the reactor itself generates the heat, and it has a, a, a fluid core. The fluid that goes through the core picks up the heat under high pressure. It's usually uh, pressurized water. There's a couple different ways to doing it, but pressurized water. There's like ma magic water that goes around, and then it goes to a heat exchanger. And then at heat exchanger, there's some another loop of fluid that doesn't interact with the reactor at all. It interacts with the fluid that comes out of the reactor, and it then that's the boiler. And then that turns the steam that turns the turbine. So now you've got two separate loops. One is exposed to radioactive stuff. The other one goes through a heat exchanger that has the radioactive exposed water going through it. And then on the other side of that, there's a cooling loop, which is a yet a third um, heat exchange, a third fluid water, usually water cooling there, that that cools the end of the steam down until it's liquid again to be pumped back to the turbine. 
But that cooling water is then what goes and will go to various means of, of cooling to the atmosphere. So there's actually three loops. It's that third loop. Which, that loop, ever, which loop got, got flooded in Japan? Which one? Was one of those loops, right? That got flooded? Yeah. Was it the water reservoir or something? Well, they still can't go in, still. Uh, they have a couple of different issues there. Okay. The, the cooling loop shut down. So the, the, the cooling loop, the, um, I'm not 100% sure, but, but basically what happened was um, the electricity stopped, so the pump stopped. Okay. Everything stopped, except the reaction didn't really stop. And it started boiling, and the, the reactor vessel started getting, and it's high enough temperatures that some of the water was getting disassociated into oxygen and hydrogen. It got high enough temperature that lit off, and then it did a pressure release out of the reactor of radioactive, potentially radioactive, whatever, within a containment building. So the reactor's in a containment building, and the containment, they're trying to flood the containment building. They also had, um, the leftover fuel, most plants just have this holding area that this is where we uh, pool that we keep the leftover fuel in and until someone comes along to pick it up, but there's nobody like signed up to pick it up, so they just keep putting more. Basically, it's like imagine your garbage cans and you never take, no one takes garbage away uh, because they're still coming up with political ways to deal with that. Is that what energy solution for this in Salt Lake? Probably. Okay. Yeah, because they're talking about that part of the world in the desert, uh, Yucca Mountain, and we talked about it, but it hasn't happened. So, uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. There, there's different ways that, that things happen. There's uh, been three major accidents that I'm aware of. Was it Chernobyl or Looker? Okay. Chern Chernobyl was a different kind of reactor, okay. but it 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 was the actual. It was yeah, still pretty bad up there. Yeah, that's 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 the nastiest one. Um, and then there was Three Mile Island, which wasn't so much of a nasty thing, other than it said the industry said, "Oh, this can't happen here," and it did. Where was it? Three and Mile? Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania. Oh, it is America. Yeah, oh. that was the first one. That I'm, I mean, there's obviously been others. I had a, a um, professor that worked for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in like the early 1950s or something, and they were going to prove that you know there wouldn't be a nuclear explosion. That, the reactors are safe, so they rigged up a small reactor in Idaho. There's Idaho National Lab. That's where they were working at the time. They put a small reactor, and the control rod. There's a control rod. There's there's fuel rods, and then in between them are these control rods. They're like sponges that, that limit the reaction. The reaction's always happening in the control rods, but you don't get a chain reaction unless you get enough of them going off. So, so these control rods go between, and it's carbon that that absorbs. Um, and other stuff too, I suppose. But um, so they got a control rod, a couple control rods, and rigged them up with with uh, spring spring loaded, Damn. and and then they they backed up a ways and got behind a rock, and they pushed the button, and the control rods went ping, and they're saying yeah, no explosion, and also went <laughs> <laughs> but it was a steam explosion, and it was a con it wasn't a nuclear explosion. It was because the the steam built up, and it built up fast enough, faster than the pressure relief on uh, the water there could relieve it, and the pressure built up to the point where the the casing itself turned into kind of a grenade, and and it went boom. But it was a steam explosion, and it, they did prove, oh, you can't have a nuclear explosion, but they proved you need bigger relief valves. Um, so. Um, so we're not going to talk any more about nuclear to speak of, particularly, other than uh, it's just a different way of getting the heat instead of burning fuel. And by the way, there's no carbon pollution from, from uh, nuclear power because it's not consuming oxygen. So from a global warming perspective, it's a really good thing from a terrorist blowing up plutonium bombs over New York City, it's a bad thing. Uh, so, you know, we are going to look at steam turbine cycles, and if in nuclear is your interest, it's just a different way of getting the heat to it. We're not even talking about how, how much coal it takes. Actually, 411, we talked about, uh, you know, what quantity of energy, what it looks like. Uh, to give you a, a rundown, a, 
typical like 100 megawatt power plant, I think it's, maybe it's 500 megawatt power plant, which is your standard sort of big power plant these days. Um, takes like three or four trains of coal a week. And then it, each train has 100 cars, and it takes almost a week just to unload them, I would think. I, I'm not sure how you unload, you know, when we're talking those trains, they're, they're the ones, they, they go through town here. There's a unit train with a bunch of hopper cars, you know, a couple <coughs> miles long. Just the, the concept of stopping the car and parking it and opening it up until it's empty and then doing the next one, it's like just, just the unloading part of it is a pretty phenomenal thing to think about. And that's like the least thing about the power plant. So um, there's one in Centralia that runs on coal, and it's was been there for years because there used to be a coal mine there, but they don't use that coal anymore. It got too far underground, I guess. And then the process of converting it by 2020 to natural gas. Uh, it'll still be a power plant, it just won't have trains showing up. It'll all come in a big tube from somewhere. So. Laws of thermodynamics. I think way back when we talked about okay, this brief overview, because I, I didn't see where it was all together, but there's the first law, there's the second law. First law says conservation of energy, what goes in must come out, kind of sort of. It might change forms, but it's all there. Second law says there's a quality to it and there's entropy, which we'll talk about eventually. But in order to, to define those things, they had to say, um, well, how do, we, how do we measure the energy? And one of the ways you measure it is with thermometer. So they realized they'd already named this first law, but they needed a law that, that, that came before it so that they could measure the first law. So they gave it, uh, they just subtracted one and call it the zeroth law of thermodynamics. And they, they yeah, if two bodies are the same temperature, meaning a thermometer and, and coffee cup one. And a third body is in equilibrium with another one. That's put the thermometer in the other cup of coffee, and it says the same thing. Then, by golly, those two cups of coffee are the same temperature. OK, <laughs> common sense. They had to call it a law. So anyway, um, <laughs> thermometers work. That's the thermometer is the third body, I guess. Um, that's all you need to know about that. There won't necessarily be a quiz on that, but that's actually in all the all the books. I don't know. Somebody had a sense of humor. I mean, you know, you think of these guys as being super geeky, but they, some of these guys in the way back days probably had a pretty good sense of humor on top of it. Yes? I, I actually wonder if they knew that common sense in our day and age actually become more of a superpower or something. Ah, that's a good point. Common sense in these days is uncommon sometimes. I've actually ran into a marine that calls it the sixth sense now. Yeah, 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 it's the sixth sense. Yeah, they used to call it horse sense. Back when you had horses, you had to have common sense or you're going to get trampled. <laughs> These days, I guess I shouldn't shouldn't admit this, but I did get run over by my car. <laughs> and I was the only one there, but it wasn't. Wait, what? <laughs> you were the only one there? Well, I wasn't exactly. I was. It, <laughs> the car died. Mm -hmm. Right, and it wouldn't. It, the, the 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 hose for the clutch like exploded, and we were in the fifty million dollar, fifty thousand silver dollar bar in Montana on I five or I ninety or whatever way the heck in back, backwoods Montana, um, and we called the tow truck, and the tow truck came. My wife was there and my nephew, and they were sitting there, and I was moving the car. I couldn't turn the engine on because then it would just just go, no control. So I took off the brake and I had the door open and I, I was kind of steering like this and all of a sudden the door caught my leg and then my leg wrapped around the oh. other leg and then the door pushed me over and oh. and about that time my nephew says, look Aunt Lee, the ah. car's running over Uncle Roger. <laughs> <laughs> and about then they're on the other side of the car and the door was open. I just fell in front of the door, and I kind of rolled with it, and the door went over my back, and it kind of hurt. It got a little scraped up, but when it went over, it kind of raised the car up like that, and it looked like the car went <laughs> like that. And yeah, they thought I really got run over, but uh, yeah. I could have had a little more common sense. 
I, should I admit these things? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure we all have something more so we're still trying to listen. Oh yeah, everyone has something. That's fine. So um centigrade, Celsius, I sort of you know, basically <coughs> Celsius scale takes from zero to hundred degrees and breaks it into a hundred divisions. And that's how big a uh, but the use hundred degrees C is uh, essentially distilled water, one standard atmosphere pressure, it will boil at 100 degrees C. We're going to do the experiment on Thursday with um, exploring how thermometers work, essentially thermal couples, why a thermal couple works and what it does. Uh, we aren't going to get to 100 degrees C because we're at 1,600 foot altitude and and not only that, but if there's a negative atmosphere, if there's negative pressure in the building, if there's, or if there's a positive pressure, the pressure in this room is such that we'll probably luck, lucky to get to 99.6 or something like that. 98, I forget what the number is. Uh, we'll figure that out with tables. Um, but that's how what it's based on. Fahrenheit scale, zero was some ice and salt water. Anyone ever do like the ice cream making thing? If you put salt in ice, it forces the ice to give up heat and that water will, will chill down to... I've done I've done that with beer. Yeah. Get yeah, beer cold really, really quick. DVD where they do in a little that. pool. Beer, put a little pool. Yep. And, and I can see it too Way back when they thought they were getting like the ultimate coldest temperature you could ever imagine. And, and, and Zero degrees Fahrenheit, is that cold? Yeah, it's like minus 16 degrees, or 50, minus, probably minus 15, 16 degrees centigrade. It's way below freezing. It gets that cold here sometimes. Less common these days, but uh, it's been 10 below uh, since I've been around now for uh, 10 below Fahrenheit. Well, they were trying to get really cold temperature, and it was like zero was ultimate cold, and 100 degrees was body temperature. But if they were off, somebody was off by 124 degrees, or not sure, maybe boiling turned out to be about 212, and maybe they're trying to match it because if you look between freezing temperature here is 32 and 212, you got 180 degrees Fahrenheit between those two, and you got 100 degrees. You know, I don't know how they jack this one around, but because basically it was about these two things. The ice salt water bath gave you the ultimate zero, so we thought 100 degrees body temperature, which, you know, centigrade, Celsius. What is the conversion? Is that 9.7 times Celsius over 2? Is that what it is? Um, it's 9 fifths or 5 ninths because it's 18, 18 versus 180 versus 100 is 18 versus 10, and it's 9 versus 5. And, okay. And so 9.5 times the Celsius over two. Uh, no, no two. Just Nine plus five plus like a 32 degree offset. I think it was the formula. There's the formula. Oh, so, there you go. Um, you know, sometimes this seems really confusing. But just remember that if you've got 100 Fahrenheit degrees, you're going to have fewer centigrade degrees. If you have 100 centigrade degrees, you're going to have more Fahrenheit degrees, plus there's a 32 degree offset. So if you have Fahrenheit, you have to subtract the 32 to get you up to freezing, and then divide by 1.8, which is 9 over 5. Kelvin is so much better. And Kelvin and Rankin, that's the other thing with, with Rankin degrees, and Fahrenheit, it also has that offset in it, that 32 degrees. So uh, you know, can I have that up here? Yeah, but Kelvin, you just add 173. Yeah, it's like 459 um, here, but you also have to add that 32, and then if you do the five nines, you get 273. But they express the same thing. How did they find this? They had different gases, different temperatures, pressures, whatever, and as I do gas laws, it says, you know, it's proportional. and all these gases at different temperature, pressure, what have you, or, or if you took data points, you can't get down to this point, but they all pointed to 
instead of zero degrees centigrade, all these lines pointed to the same point, and that, that's how they figured out where that point is. Um, I don't know that anyone's ever actually reached this point, and if they did, they probably couldn't measure it anyway, because the thermometer would be frozen, right? But uh, with the ideal gas law, all the sort of things point in that direction. And there's weird things that happen if you get cold enough, it starts changing phase. Uh, you can't really get there. Um, helium is probably the, the thing that condenses at the lowest temperature. But that's how we know where absolute zero is. Um, there's two kinds of pressure: the gauge pressure and the gauge pressure and absolute pressure. That you need to you just need the context <coughs> you need to sort of figure out. But if you measure uh, your tire and, and put the gauge on it, it says it's 30 psi. That's gauge pressure. It's measuring relative to the environment that the gauge is in. If you took the same gauge and the same tire and took it up to the moon where there is no atmosphere, and you put the gauge on there, it read 30 degrees in, uh, on Earth. What's it going to read on the moon? Two. Minus two? B. Floating. Oh no, not, not, no twos involved. It's it's gonna it's gonna read the absolute pressure, and the absolute pressure is greater than gauge pressure by the atmospheric pressure that it was measuring against. So it'll be comparing to zero pressure. You're gonna end up another 15, 14.696 okay. officially, or whatever atmospheric pressure is. Um, around 15, so it's going to measure about probably like 45 psi. Nothing changed. If the temperature is the same, there's the same pressure in the tire, um, but just the gauge is measuring relative to the environment that it's in, which generally is atmosphere, and the atmosphere around is a little bit less than 15 psi, and then as you go up in altitude, it drops even more. Same with heat, huh? Not only altitude, if it's colder or hotter, would it change as well? Uh, the temperature at higher altitude elevations tends to be cooler. I'm asking so because sometimes your car's fine, but then it's really cold in the morning, and then your tire light comes on, and then throughout the day it gets warmer, and then oh, it goes yeah. off. Yeah, yeah, right. The, the pressure actually on the moon, the pressure would have gone down because ideal gas law says if you got the same amount of of, of stuff and the temperature goes down, then if the volume stayed the same, the entire volume doesn't change much. The pressure is going to have to be proportional to the temperature you cook at. But it's absolute pressure is proportional to absolute temperature. So it just goes down a little because you know if it drops 30 degrees overnight from 60 to 30 degrees, well that's 30 degrees out of 273 or 460 or whatever. So Um, so Pascal's Newton per square meter, uh, where it's psi pounds per square inch, and atmospheric pressure. Uh, atmospheric pressure is 101,000 Pascals, 101 kilopascals, or 15 psi. So that means. You know, this is a little bit of force over a square meter as opposed to a fair amount of force over a square inch. So the scale is different on these units, but they, they cannot talk about the same thing. Um, this is sort of more about the fluids class. We'll get into a bunch of this in fluids. But um, if you pressurize something, the pressure acts in all directions equally. So it doesn't matter, like if you're in a swimming pool and there's a ledge or you know, and you, oh man, you know, my, my ears are really hurting me. I can hold my breath for another five minutes, but down this this I'm gonna hide, you know, hide under this shelf underwater because my ears are really hurting, and that way I'll be sheltered from the pressure. It doesn't work that way because 
the pressure transmits through a fluid. It just, it's wherever you are, it, it acts perpendicular to the wall, whatever surface, and you can't hide from it. It just goes. So um, that's what it's acting normal to whatever surface you're pushing against. You can't hide from the pressure just by, like, in the shade. It doesn't do that. Um, and the pressure under a fluid is due to the density of the fluid and gravity and height. Now, if you have like an elevator that's a super fast elevator and you have a um, can of fluid of some sort and the elevator accelerates up, it's got gravity going down plus the, the acceleration, you know, you can feel you know, your knees kind of buckle if you get on a like, high-speed elevator uh, when it accelerates. That, will, that acceleration is part of, you know, it's the whole acceleration. Most of the time we're just talking about plain old gravity. But if you're in a, uh, or in, in a car, uh, a tank could explode, could, could rupture if, like these long tanks for like a fuel truck or a water truck, say, uh, if it got in a crash, the deceleration of that tank could be enough to like, blow it out at the front end of it if it exceeded the pressure rating of the tank from the deceleration. The water sloshes and it's, it's, it's being decelerated. It, it could you know, generate enough pressure from that acceleration crashing into a tree that the tank actually explodes from a pressure uh, thing. But most of the time, we're just talking about plain old gravity. 9.81 meters per second, 32.2 uh, feet per second squared. Um, and it makes a difference if we're talking about gauge pressure, absolute pressure. And when we're talking ideal gas law, we're always going to need to use absolute pressure for our um, pressure in the formula. And that's just whatever that whatever the atmospheric pressure is times density times gravity times height. And if you do the numbers on this, uh, you're going to end up with pressure. Uh, gauge pressure is only about that because it's relative. It's the gauge is is, is comparing pressure relative to atmospheric pressure. We have um, pressure gauges in the back room that we're going to use, and there's some that are absolute pressure and some that are gauge pressure or differential pressure. It can measure the difference between two pressures, or you leave one end unconnected, and it's, that end becomes atmospheric reference, so it becomes gauge pressure. And then there's ones that they're always comparing something to something else, so there is an absolute pressure gauge. I'm pretty sure there's a little like vacuum, perfect vacuum on one side that it's comparing the pressure to. And there's different ways they'll do it, but usually there's a diaphragm and it will have a sensor on it. It could be a strain gauge, it could be a piezoelectric thing stretching, and it's basically measuring how much that that diaphragm is, is stretching according to the, the pressure that's being applied to it. So if you have a fluid like this, and the actual pressure, you'll see these these sort of these uh, uh, trapezoid. That's that's a representation of the pressure um, it's a diagram of sort of the, the, how the pressure works. This flat section up here would be the atmospheric pressure, and then there's a triangle that starts, if H is zero, then the gauge pressure will be zero. And the triangle part is sort of the gauge pressure part of it. And uh, so the total pressure here increases as you go down. And point A is going to have the same pressure as point B as point C, as long as they're all at the same height. And that pressure acts perpendicular to the surface. Um, 
point D and point E have the same pressure, and F and G have the same pressure, but the vectors are pointing different ways because the wall is pointing a different way. Uh, point I has more pressure because it's deeper. And over here, uh, point H, this here they happen to have some mercury at the bottom of this lake. And that's denser than water, so you go down to this depth, that's the water pressure, and then you add to that uh, this depth at a different density, because mercury is 13 times the density of water. And you, this would be much higher pressure than this is. So um, that's uh, again more about fluids than thermal, but we'll probably be using some of this stuff. Uh, here's some of the gauges, uh, example of some of the gauges that we use. Um, you've probably seen these, you know, your typical dial gauge, old school, works fine, not electronic. And basically what goes on with one of these is, you ever seen the, the party, party thing that you burp, you know, you blow into and they unroll and then they go blah, blah, blah. <laughs> That's what they're doing here. When you pressurize it, it, it unrolls this curve. This curve, it, it wants to straighten out. And depending on the materials, I think they can make these for different um, sensitivities. And on the end of it, there's a little wire or a chain that goes to a mechanism that turns your dial. So when you put the pressure on it, it expands. It forms <coughs> not, well, not, it's, it's within its um, elastic range. You're not bending it. And that's what it is the needle in. So you, you dial it up so the needle goes to zero and this is zero and if the scaling is correct, then your gauge reads right. If you overpressurize it, then you end up yielding the material and it bends a little bit and then, then it becomes out of calibration and it might go not only out of calibration but uh, scaling might get punctured too. But uh, usually there's a way to come the good gauge is a way to correct your zero and bring it back to zero. Um, and you can test and see if 100 pounds it still gives you 100 pounds. But uh, that's how those work. The electronic ones like this, you will use some just like this. Here's the differential gauge. The difference between this pressure and that pressure, it will read or leave it open. Um, put the pressure here, and it just it reads gauge pressure. So this is the atmospheric tank. Um, and depending on whether it's a strain gauge on the diaphragm, uh, strain gauge would uh, change resistance as it stretches. Um, where the piezoelectric transducer will generate a voltage as it gets squished. Um, usually all that gets handled by the electronics inside. You don't have to worry about it, it'll just read you out uh, a value. Um, barometers read atmospheric pressure, and it's reading the rho GH of the atmosphere. The problem with the atmosphere is that it's a gas and the density changes with the altitude. As the pressure increases, the density increases. So to you could do an integration from zero pressure down to whatever. And, and you know the, the problem with the atmosphere is it's not like water. There's no surface tension. So you can't say you can tell where the top of a swimming pool is. But you have to define the you know, the top of the atmosphere is when the pressure is below some pressure or something, and there's still atmosphere above it, but it's, it doesn't have a lid on it as such. So you can't just use rho GH. You could take atmospheric pressure and atmospheric density and calculate, well, if there was all this density, you know, we'd have like a thousand feet of atmosphere or something. Um, I don't know what the number is on that. Um, but you know, the density varies not only with height, but with temperature, and the temperature drops with uh, height, and it, it's, it gets a real, there's people that really like that kind of challenge, and by golly, they're the ones that gave us the information. We're just going to use it. Standard atmosphere has been defined. 
it's uh, a column of mercury, 760 millimeters in height at 100 degrees or at zero degrees C, and standard uh, gravitational force. What does that mean? That's the height. What's the rho? They'll also uh, the rho has to be the, the density of mercury at zero degrees C. That gets you the density. That's the material and temperature. You get a density, height, and standard rho gh. Just defining it in terms of rho gh. Um, and so a lot of times they'll talk in uh, millibars. So many millibars, or they'll talk in terms of millimeters of mercury. Uh, they'll talk in terms of inches. Uh, anyone hear very much pressure talking about like you know 29.9 .9 inches and falling? Uh, that's inches of mercury. It's not really a pressure, but that's that's how they used to tell how the what the the pressure atmospheric pressure was. It was literally a, a column of mercury with a scale next to it, and you could tell if it was going up or down. Um, it works out to. 14.696 psi or 101.325 kilopascals. Notice these are six digits, five digits of precision, um, defining what the standard is. You probably never, almost never actually, they will never just be that pressure, it'll be higher and lower. But, um, so, Way back in the day, when I was a young fellow, um, they used to put cars on lifts that came out of a piston coming out of the ground. Anyone see those? They're all like these days. They're, they're not like that so much. But uh, the neat trick with this was the gas stations all had air compressors because they needed to fill up tires. And they, instead of having a whole different hydraulic pump to run one of these, what they would do is they would have a tank filled with the fluid that goes in here. And the tank filled with fluid, they would pressurize the tank with 100 PSI. And you just have an air valve, and it would pressurize the tank. And then uh, 100 PSI times a 10 inch in diameter um, piston. I don't know how 10 inch in diameter is like, you know, 100 square inches or something. No, it's not quite. Say it's uh, 80 square inches times 100 PSI. That's eight, 80 times 100. I don't know. It gets you like eight or 10,000 pounds of lifting force. And one of the things you had to watch out for, though, is if you wanted the car to just go kind of this high, you'd pressurize it, and it would start the process, and you'd had to leave off the pressure because it's going to keep going for a while until pressure's equalized. And they had stops so that it wouldn't go all the way. But you had a super high pickup truck and kind of a low ceiling, and you just kept going. You could just push the truck up through the ceiling. <laughs> but uh, you had to sort of feather that. So there was there was a little like a trick to. Uh, I, I don't think anyone ever. I'm sure somebody somewhere pushed the truck up through the ceiling. I've seen that happen. Yeah. It's, uh, and it's really just. Now, 25 centimeters is like 10 inches. Uh, 800 kilopascals, that's like 100 psi. If 8 times 15, is that right? 100 kilopascals is equivalent to atmospheric pressure. 15, uh, it's more like 120. 15 times 8 is uh, 30 times 4. That would be like 120 psi, which is really reasonable for shop air. Um, so we'll actually do these tomorrow. There's another thing. Um, mercury manometer is how they measure your blood pressure. They used to do it with a mercury manometer. There might, if you go to an old school medical place, it might have the thing, and you actually see the shiny fluid go up, and then they they watch it come down and all that. But these days, it's all like electronic. But it was based on that, and if you get blood pressure of 110 over 80, what that means is when your heart squeezes and pushes the blood, it's at a pressure of 
equivalent to 100, enough pressure would push mercury up 110 millimeters in the tube. And when your heart relaxes, it goes down to 80, and it, it's pulsing. And that, that's all about low GH. Do you do, for G, do you do gravity? 9.8? Yes. Yep, okay. 9.8. So I think where are we? Minute or, yeah, that's that's good enough. Good place to start. We'll uh, we'll talk about these tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, you only have like uh, two, three slides up. Yeah, that's it. coming right up. Okay. Yep.